Hello, and welcome to The Bard's Truth with your host, The Green Bard. This is episode 7.2, King's Blood 5, Fishing for Tinfoil and Trout. Yeah, you've been a fishing a hard time, I'm a little fishing too. I bet your life, you're loving why, it's more fish than you. Many fish my head in the Last time we discussed zombies in A Song of Ice and Fire, specifically how some of them can give us insight into the mechanism of the foreshadowed resurrection of Jon Snow. In particular, we discussed my theory on how I think Miri Mazdur purposely killed the horse of Khal Drogo in order to prevent the Khal from entering the Red Stallion and starting his second life. By doing this, when he died, his soul either faded away, or, if you believe Glytus' tinfoil, was captured by Mary Mazdor when the Cal's body died. She then resurrected his body with blood magic, but with no trace of the man inside due to her prior premeditated actions. That scene was in the first volume of A Song of Ice and Fire, A Game of Thrones, but to truly grasp the theory, we need to really understand the concept of a second life, as described in the POV of Veramir Sixskins in A Dance with Dragons, Book 5 of A Song of Ice and Fire, Prologue. Veramir, the most powerful warg among the Free Folk, suffers a mortal wound and attempts a body snatching, ultimately failing to steal the body of the spearwife Thistle, who was his last chance to have a human vessel for his second life. In the end, he does achieve a second life, when his own body dies, but it is inside the wolf, One-Eye, leader of his pack, not inside a body-snatched human. The mechanism for that soul transfer is described in the following passage. The white world turned and fell away. For a moment, it was as if he were inside the weirwood, gazing out through the carved red eyes as a dying man twitched feebly on the ground and a mad woman danced blind and bloody underneath the moon, weeping red tears and ripping at her clothes. Then both were gone and he was rising, melting, his spirit borne on some cold wind. He was in the snow and in the clouds. He was a sparrow, a squirrel, an oak. A horned owl flew silently between his trees, hunting a hare. Faramir was inside the owl, inside the hare, inside the trees. Deep below the frozen ground, earthworms burrowed blindly in the dark, and he was them as well. I am the wood, and everything that's in it, he thought, exulting. A hundred ravens took to the air, cawing as they felt him pass. A great elk trumpeted, unsettling the children clinging to his back. A sleeping direwolf raised its head to snarl at empty air. Before their hearts could beat again, he had passed on, searching for his own, for one eye, sly and stalker, for his pack. His wolves would save him, he told himself. That was his last thought as a man. True death came suddenly. He felt a shock of cold, as if he had been plunged into the icy waters of a frozen lake. Then he found himself rushing over moonlit snows with his packmates close behind him. Half the world was dark. One eye, he knew. He bayed, and Sly and Stalker gave echo. To summarize, just before the moment of death, he basically flits around the world from being to being, briefly residing in or perhaps pulled into almost becoming the weirwood net, the forest itself, until landing in the wolf with which he had his closest bond, One eye. Speaking of wolves, Summer, Bran's wolf, is clearly the dire wolf that snarls at him in the scene. Learn all about their bond in my Dire Wolves of Winterfell series. Back to Veramir, the premise of my theory is that George R.R. R. Martin knew this mechanism of soul transfer while writing A Game of Thrones, only choosing to share it with us in A Dance with Dragons. My faith that he did understand this part of his magical world so early is due to his having written works such as The Glass Flower earlier in his career. That short story is all about the consciousness shifting from vessel to vessel, not all of them human. To me, that's enough to justify the theory, but the bigger takeaway in relation to Jon Snow's resurrection is that the body can be brought back from death with magic, blood magic in the case of the cow. In Jon's case, there are all sorts of magical beings around to supply that magic. Melisandre could use fire magic or blood magic. Patchface and Shireen have water magic and maybe stone magic in their pasts. 
Blood Raven and the Children of the Forest could supply Green Seer magic or natural slash tree magic. And of course there's the others and their ice magic. All are lingering in John's story, so we can't really be sure how his body will be resurrected. We can be sure that it will happen though. What we hope is that he comes back into a fully functional body, with precious little of his mind lost to his premature death, though with his magical ability likely heightened. We've already looked at the extreme where all of his mind is lost but the body remains functional with Drogo. Now we'll consider another extreme case, with a body that is partially decayed and a consciousness that is nigh unrecognizable, Lady Stoneheart. A Trout Into the River By way of contrast to that stated goal for John, Kat's resurrection definitely suggests that she lost a lot of herself to death. Indeed, Thoros of Myr tells us that she had been dead for three days when the Brotherhood found her, and Beric Dondarrion resurrected her. She is, said Thoros of Myr. The phrase slashed her throat from ear to ear. When we found her by the river, she was three days dead. Harwin begged me to give her the kiss of life, but it had been too long. I would not do it. So Lord Beric put his lips to hers instead, and the flame of life passed from him to her. And she rose. May the Lord of Light protect us, she rose. A Feast for Crows, Brienne ate. That's a long time for a body not to be breathing. She was definitely dead, no question about that. We learn from Beric that a piece of himself is lost each time he dies. While he died numerous times, all of them were relatively brief deaths none approaching three days. Surely she lost a lot of herself. That's evident. Catelyn as Lady Stoneheart has more of the aspect of a phantom, a wraith, than that of a lady. Definitely a fair bit of her was lost during this period on the dark side of death. One might suggest that this is mainly due to the decay of her body, but my focus is more on her mind or her spirit. With that, there is a huge issue with Cat's resurrection. First, she goes kind of insane just before death. Second, where was her consciousness while her body was dead? She never had a skin changer bond with a beast, so no likely horse or wolf was at hand. Is it possible that her consciousness just flitted around as Veramir's did, but for three days? I can't eliminate it, and certainly that's a likely mechanism for someone who is dead for a short period like Beric had been, but with Cat, I find it highly unlikely, especially given the contrast to how quickly Veramir finds his host's body in one eye. I suppose that she could have gone into the Weirwood net, as Veramir briefly did, but I find two problems with this as well. One, the length of time, again, and two, that the definition from Merriam-Webster's of a weir is a fence or enclosure set in a waterway for taking fish. That probably means that the Weirwood net is a net in two separate ways. First, in the way we typically think, a network of trees, something akin to a computer network, like the internet. Certainly, Bloodraven is teaching Bran to learn from the memories stored in the trees, just like we use the internet as a host of knowledge in real life. However, it is also literally a net, a net for catching souls, trapping them. This is a concept that LML has fleshed out a number of times in his material, so I'll refer you to him for more proof. While clearly a soul can elude it, as happens with Veramir, after three days I would think that the net would have a tight hold on any soul. For further evidence that this is how it might work in George R. R. Martin's literature, try reading A Song for Leah. So, against those two unsatisfying possibilities, I have a third idea, one that is fully in line with Veramir's concept of a second life. What if she was not waiting in a weirwood or in the ether, but inside a trout, specifically a brook trout? I know, that sounds kind of ridiculous. It is ridiculous, or at least... I had meant it to be ridiculous the first time I suggested it in a recent Reddit post. But that doesn't mean it isn't right. The more and more I think about it, a trout may very well be the vessel where Cat resided for those three days. Now obviously, there is not a lot of evidence for this theory. It's more of a hypothesis. But there is some supporting evidence, most of it falling in the category of symbolism and imagery. Her sigil is the obvious thing that put the idea in my head. Her body is also flung into the river by the phrase in a mockery of the Tully funeral rites. That ritual, though, may be a modern echo of a more ancient first man rite symbolizing the passage to the second life. In that light, it actually is better evidence than one might initially think. And she's physically close to the fish also, which circumstantially is convenient to this theory. 
Then there is her appearance, which is, well, fishy. Very fishy, in fact. Let's consider it from Rien's POV. Lady Stoneheart lowered her hood and unwound the gray scarf from her face. Her hair was dry and brittle, white as bone. Her brow was mottled green and gray, spotted with brown blooms of decay. The flesh from her face clung in ragged strips from her eyes down to her jaw. Some of the rips were crusted with dried blood, but others gaped open to reveal the skull beneath. Let's consider each of the aspects of her appearance that are reminiscent of a fish or trout. 1. Her hair, dry and brittle, white as a bone, is exactly what the dorsal fin of a fish would be once out of water. 2. Her cheeks, rips, crusted with dried blood, are described almost as if they are gills. There can be no mistaking this if you reread the passage with that idea in mind. As Egg would say, it's right there. And it is there right down to the crusted blood, giving them the deep red color of gills. 3. Her skin coloring, mottled green and gray, spotted with brown blooms of decay, is almost directly an amalgam of what you might read in a sport fisherman's almanac description of a brook, brown, or rainbow trout. I will point out one drawback of this theory. Veramir doesn't seem to think that he'll ever get out of one eye. So how can Cat get out of her fish? I'll point out that she's not actually bonded with these fish, so the pull to them might not be that strong. And they have small brains, so she may not truly fit inside them anyway. She may actually be bouncing around from fish to fish for those three days. Ugh, my head's starting to hurt. I'll stop there. <laughs> Since there is not a lot more to this theory, now I want to talk about George R. R. Martin's aims with this character. First, I think that regardless of whether my theory is right, it's clear that a lot of the character that was Catelyn is missing in Lady Stoneheart, who seems to exist only for revenge against the Freys and Lannisters, although she may also be trying to retrieve her girls, knowing now that Arya is alive. Someone who was once so dynamic is now nothing more than these single-minded goals. This is somewhat parallel to how Beric Dondarrion continued to lead his band of outlaws in a single purpose that Ned gave them, to deliver the king's justice even though that king was long dead. This might be seen as a pattern that Jon Snow would follow, though I would caution against adopting it as a conclusion. Kat seems to have lost a lot of herself due to the time dead, either by decay of her body or the waning of her soul's essence. Similarly, Beric has died seven times, and he is resurrected by Thoros. After the sixth resurrection, Thoros says, and each time is harder. In response, Beric confirms the extent of his degradation. Can I dwell on what I scarce remember? I held a castle on the marches once, and there was a woman I was pledged to marry. But I could not find that castle today, nor tell you the color of that woman's hair. Who knighted me, old friend? What were my favorite foods? It all fades. Sometimes I think I was born on the bloody grass in that grove of ash, with the taste of fire in my mouth and a hole in my chest. Are you my mother, Thoros? A storm of swords. Arya 7. Later, Beric says, Fire consumes. Lord Beric stood behind them, and there was something in his voice that silenced Thoros at once. It consumes, and when it is done, there is nothing left. Nothing. A Storm of Swords, Arya 8. It's fair to say that Beric feels a bit of himself was consumed each time. I surmise, also, that in her one death, a large bit of Catalan was consumed. It's clear from the overall read of their stories that Beric and Lady Stoneheart are quite degraded from their original selves, either by that repeated fire magic or the effect of time dead. My main point in this discussion is that Beric and Lady Stoneheart are cautionary tales that in George R. R. Martin's world, resurrected humans shouldn't be expected to come back, quote, normal, unquote. This is also reflected in his criticism of J.R.R. Tolkien's Gandalf the White, who he says shouldn't be. He loves Gandalf the Grey, though. He just thinks Gandalf should have stayed dead. Now, with Jon Snow, the situation may be different. He has a better vessel to dwell in with Ghost. And, while fire consumes, cold preserves. But we'll discuss that another time. Either way, what I've been trying to say here is that Cat is a fish. Er, she's a catfish. Uh, <laughs> pun intended. 
Uh, did the author intend this terrible pun, though? Or is it all my own? Uh, surely he did. In honor of that realization, I've written a Red Wedding-themed version of the old-time American folk song, Fishing Blues. We'll let the credits roll to it. You heard the first verse in the in intro. Here's the conclusion of it. And I'll also release the entire track as a dire wolf cover. <laughs> 